Hello and welcome back to In Pursuit Of. I am continuing my conversation with Rajan Mehta, author of Backstage Climate. And Rajan is in pursuit of ensuring that climate change conversations become center stage so that everyone, each one of us can do something about it. So Rajan, I'm curious to know what inspired you to write this book. I mean, we're all talking about it all the time, but now you've gone and written a book. Exactly what you said uh, just now, Parnap. Uh, you know, something back, uh, there was a survey done uh, and, uh, you know, there, were, there was a multiple choice question saying, what is climate change? A was summer, winter, autumn, spring, and B was heat waves, floods, sea level rise. 53% of the people said it was summer, winter, autumn, spring. Are you kidding and me? And that kind of woke me up. And my idea was to bring climate discussion center stage, take them to the dining table of people so that they end up talking about it, become aware about it, because I believe awareness is the first step to change. Right. So that was the idea. The second idea also, the reason why I structured the book like this was, uh, I, I spoke to many scientists uh, involved in climate change and they understood everything about the science behind climate change, the, the science or the distribution of carbon, which is the main cause sure. uh, about it. But they had no clue about the power structures in the world or the distribution of power. They had no clue about the economic structures in the world and you know how wealth flows. And unless you kind of marry, marry the two. Uh, them together, change will not happen because the interests are so vested. You know, the society, the economy, our industry has been built on this. So my idea was that I wanted to give a broad sweep so that scientists, if they happen to read this book, get to know something at least about the Economics the politics and the politics behind, behind, it, behind the it, the science, uh, sorry, the economics behind it, and likewise for the politicians and the economists, so that they could then connect the dot. Because if you have a broader vision, a broader uh, panoramic view of the whole thing, you'll be able to put together solutions better. Very nice. So, but, but, but I have a question for you where, you know, and I, at the same time when I got your book and I started reading it, a friend of mine decided to go for a holiday where the resort was literally on the river. Like you look out and you topple in types, right? And I am thinking that here we're all talking about climate change. What prompts people to do something like this? Because you're actually fueling um, a situation where there'll be more places like that yeah, because yeah. you loved it, right? How can we change this? Oh, uh, that's a very interesting observation, you know. And one may think that you know, there's so much of gloom and doom being spoken about climate change, uh, yet we don't seem to be doing enough. Right. And in my view, there are a few fundamental issues that uh, climate change faces. One of them, it's a collective action problem. Right. Our lives have been built around fossil fuels and emissions. I'm as much of a culprit as you are and anybody else. And I'm not ready to change my lifestyle because I think Everybody is having a party. So my changing does not help. So I would wait for you to change, wait for others to change, and then I'll think about changing. So it is. it has become everyone's problem. And everyone's problem is no one's, no problem. one's problems. We're all kind of looking at each other. And the second issue is it's a tragedy of commons. What this means is that if I'm emitting greenhouse gases, they're going up, mixing in the air, and may go and cause a storm in Florida. So I, as the perpetrator, I'm not the sufferer, and I know it, right, that my actions may not impact me, may impact somebody else, right? And therefore, I have no incentive to stop my emissions. Like that, that's the thinking of everyone, individuals, companies, nations. So very little action. So companies and nations are made up of individuals. Absolutely. <laughs> the third issue also I must bring to the fore is, we are living in an age of instant gratification, whereas any efforts to address climate change cannot be instant. You know, 
If you plant a tree, that will start absorbing carbon dioxide after 10 years, 20 years. Any project that you want to take, it'll, its gestation period would be very long. Whereas we individuals, if we feel hot in the morning, I want the AC in the evening. I don't want to wait, you know, for a month, bear it till it gets, you know, it becomes okay. I will go and buy. Companies behave that way. They are now governed by the stock markets on quarterly results. So climate needs investments. They would not put the investments onto things that can help address climate or make their products greener or more eco-friendly. Right, because that is not going to help the bottom line. Absolutely. Right? So those investments are getting kind of ignored. Right. Even if you look at nations, nations or governments are run by politicians. Politicians come for a, a tenure, four years, five years, and in that period, whatever they do, it's not going to show impact. <laughs> you know, they have to show growth, development. You know, make their presence felt and get ready for the next cycle. Right. And rightly so, because that's how, you know, we are the culprits. That's how we reward them. And therefore, you will hear a lot of lip service by them globally about climate change, but no real action, right? No money going into it. They'll keep pussyfooting on it. Whereas you want to have a bridge which uses cement and steel and everything else, it'll be there in the next three years, but not climate. So I think these are the three fundamental issues which are dampening our focus on climate action. In your book, have you um, spoken of how the role of technology and innovation in tackling climate change? Um, you know, because there's so much AI out there and tech, tech out there, but even then, we are still not able to, of course, everybody's working towards it. But how important is it as of today? One is there's human behavior and then there's this. Well, I think technology uh, will be the answer. That will be our savior because ultimately just changing human behavior is not enough and changing human behavior is very difficult you know none of us are willing to give our lifestyle so we will have to call on technology and hum human beings are very ingenious they will come up with it you know even in the past if you remember in the 1950s 60s there was this thing that the world is going to run out of food india especially right but this whole alarm uh, kind of gave an impetus to the scientists, technologists, and a lot of focus was put on food technology or food science. And today we are sitting on surplus food, right? Same way, I have no doubt in my mind that technology will solve the climate crisis, but that's not where it ends because technology will solve the problem, but we don't know the unknowns it will create. So it always happens that way. You solve one thing and you create something. Another problem. Which, right. <laughs> so I think I write, I, I've described it in my book as well, that it's like riding a tiger, right? Uh, when you're riding a tiger, you can't afford to dismount because the moment you do, the tiger will swallow you. So we will solve this problem through technology, but what it leaves behind is to be seen. Coming back to how uh, technology can solve it, one is you're seeing in this whole transition to clean energy, it's technology that's coming to our rescue, right? In the whole industrial decarbonization, whether it's cement or steel, it's technology which is coming to our rescue. Right. Even in land use and agriculture, it's, you know, you're using various kinds of technologies now, farming technologies, you know, methane reduction, which are coming to our use. More importantly, I'm going to talk about two things or three things here very quickly. Sure. Even if we stop emitting greenhouse gases today, the problem is not going to go away because there are so much of there in the atmosphere. Sure. So you have to suck them out, right? Mm. And that will can only be done through technology. It can, you know, so obviously like there are some nature-based... Create that, a methane sucker. Yes. One is you can do it through nature by growing more plants and this and that. And even in that, you want to grow plants which can kind of suck more. Uh, and there's genetic engineering happening that will develop those kind of per plant varieties that can suck more. But the technology is called direct air capture coming up, which can actually suck out carbon dioxide. Seriously? From the, so yes, I was not wrong when I said create something oh, which no, actually absolutely, is, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. 
For methane, there is not one, but for carbon dioxide, you suck it, concentrate it, and sequester it, and put it, shove it under the ground, or you make something out of it. Wow. So these are already kind of on the way, or they're actually small commercial plants have been put up. So that's one. Another technology, you know, let's say tomorrow, there are certain events which are within the realm of possibility. If they happen, the global temperature could shoot up very quickly. Now, if that happens, what do we do, right? So people are looking at something called as the solar geoengineering. So what it does is that, if you recall, each time there's a volcano, the Earth's temperature actually comes down. Hmm, because, because what happens is... All the heat is but heat is out, then how does the temperature come down? Now, what happens is it spews a lot of ash and dust into the higher layers of the atmosphere, actually in the stratosphere. Right. And these particles go and form what are called aerosols there. And therefore, the sun's rays start getting reflected back. Okay. So what they're trying to do, learning from that, they're trying to develop a technology so that artificial aerosols can be injected into the stratosphere and keep the sun's rays away so that temporarily the uh, Earth's temperature can be brought down. But it's a geopolitical issue because, you know, for ages, uh, nations have been trying to use weather as a weapon against right. the enemy. Absolutely. And by this, you could actually do that. So there's, I mean, it's still in the very, very nuptial phases. But a lot is happening. You know, there are some really smart and driven scientists, technologists, entrepreneurs who are working day and night to make sure that, you know, we ready ourselves to be able to handle any eventuality. And I, I, I'm i fairly confident they will. What happens after is another story. What happens after <laughs> is another That could be chapter story. two of climate Absolutely. change. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll continue this conversation. Stay with us while I continue my chat with Rajan Mehta. We'll be back soon.